Uh, as we all know, we are all customers, consumers in a way of we can have our own choice of transportation. I came from Shanghai two days ago, right? The only choice I had is to fly. I wouldn't like to take a boat and come here like a month later, right? So that would defeat the purpose. But I did have a few choices. I could have a choice of direct flight from Shanghai to Detroit on Delta, or I could choose to make different stops over time and then maybe see different countries, okay? But these are the choices that we can make. But in cases where we only have one choice, like uh, before I moved to Shanghai, I live in Michigan. I actually work at, uh, as a faculty at Michigan State. Now, I live in Novi, Michigan, and then I commuted to Michigan State East Lansing. The only choice I had really to drive my own car, right? So it took about uh, 50 miles one day, an hour, one way drive, okay? I would have no other choice. But if I, even if I would be given another choice, I would still stick to my only choice, which is my only mode of transportation, using my own car, right? But now, I'm living in Shanghai, so um, I want to give you some perspective of what, where Shanghai is, right? I'm sure many of you might have visited Shanghai before. And if you see that, here's the airport. And then uh, many of you might have visited this Pearl Tower way in Pudong area, right? So uh, the distance between uh, Shanghai uh, Airport and the Pudong area is about probably 30 kilometers on the, on the, on, in that capacity. Um, now, where I live, I live somewhere right here in what we, a place called Xinjiang, okay, uh, which is further away from the main area. And I work at Jiao Tong University, which is about 10 kilometers south of that location. Now, if I had a car, I probably would drive. So that's one mode, right? But of course, I didn't have a car. So what did I do? OK, I have to live with whatever I'm given to, to uh, ride on. So here's what I do, giving you a personal perspective of what I do on a daily basis to commute to work. First, I walk about a mile, a kilometer, one kilometer. OK, it takes about 10 minutes. OK, so uh, if I walk faster, I could probably walk in eight minutes. But if I walk in a rainy day, I probably take two more minutes, OK? But the only important thing is whether I can connect to my next mode, which is on a subway, OK? Uh, usually, it takes about 15 minutes to get about 10 kilometers on the subway. If I miss the train, I can wait, always wait for the next one. It takes about five minutes to wait for the next one, OK? Now I get to all the way almost to the university, but I'm not quite there yet. I need to take another bus. OK, this bus is very short, only four kilometers. It takes about eight minutes to, uh, to take that uh, bus. Again, if I miss the connection, I would have to wait 15 minutes because that's when the next bus would come. OK, now, after all this, right, I'm finally get to the gate of the university. I'm still not there yet. OK, it's a very huge campus, just like U of M here. OK, I have to find a way to go from the main gate to my office, which I have a bike, a bicycle. So I uh, uh, spent seven minutes riding on a two kilometer and that completes my trip from my home to my office. Uh, uh, actually 17, uh, 11 kilometers, but I actually had six extra kilometers because of some of the, uh, the, the location and, and things like that. On a good day, it takes about 40 minutes to get from my home to the office. On a bad day, if I miss all the connections, if it's a rainy day and I take 20 more minutes. But the fact is, I know that I would be getting to my office within a time frame. Imagine that now if you're in Shanghai and you take a, take a taxi, okay, you think 11 kilometers of distance would take you, you know, would, you would probably be spend maybe 15 minutes on taxi ride. It turns out that it could, a 15 minutes ride could turn out to be uh, 150 minutes because the traffic is just un so unpredictable in Shanghai. Okay, so I have the choices. Right? So my choices are you know, to do different modes. I could have taken a taxi or you know, just a, a bus, or, but I decided to choose all this. So my question to myself is, can I connect to the next mode? Am I, am I comfortable in that type of you know, uh, transition from one mode to another mode? All these are very, very you know, uh, engineering-wise. Because in Shanghai, right, people have different modes of transportation. Unlike in the US, pretty much people drive. Everyone drives, in, like in Michigan, right? But in Shanghai, if you can see, uh, from 1986 all the way to about 2000, this is a survey uh, done in the, over 15 years uh, uh, of time, uh, mostly people walked in the beginning, and then people bicycle and do moped, and then, uh, uh, and then car and bus, right, transportation. And then from 1986 to about to, uh, 15 years later, about 2000, right, a lot less people are walking. Still, a lot of people are still walking, but you know, the proportion is seemed to be a lot reduced. Most people are now relying on public transportation in, in Shanghai. Just a fact, because you know, as we learned all this morning, right? You know, there are so many uh, people in, in China, in Shanghai, and so little cars. So that people rely a lot on public transportation, which is a key for us to study in this 
uh, 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 project. Of course, there are many factors that affect the travel in Shanghai or any, maybe any other big cities around the world. But again, right, take, let's take the uh, perspective of living in Shanghai. Uh, if you have the opportunity, come, because you, know, you really feel that Shanghai has 23 million people. And then, uh, you know, so we all have many different needs of travel, right? Uh, these are uh, identified as some of the main reasons why we have to increase our travel in Shanghai, because uh, growth in population. Very simply, because most of the migrants from other provinces are all finding job opportunity in Shanghai, so they all move to Shanghai, and you know, for opportunities. As economy is growing, so is their income, so they're able to spend more time on the road, travel around, doing all, all shopping or trips like that. And also, urban expansion is a key factor. Uh, used to be that you know, most of the jobs are probably you know, within a certain specific location, but later on, right, you know, um, uh, uh, businesses and all things start to decentralize. So now there are people are traveling more just to get from their home you know, to the workplace. And another interesting factor that affects you know, the travel is because uh, in the older days, right, you know, if you have a job, let's say, uh, from the from an enterprise or from the government, you are provided the housing pretty much next to where you work. But those days are gone, okay? These days, right, if you find a job, right, the company won't provide any residence for you. So you might have to find a job here and then find your home there and everywhere. So the travel also increases that way. Last but not least is really the rapid motorization of the auto industry in China. So you know that uh, designated by the Chinese government as the, the, the 12th, 5th, or the 8th, 5th, five-year plan in uh, 1995. So uh, auto industry has been uh, dedicated, designated as a uh, pillar industry of the, of the Chinese national economy. So all of a sudden, right, you know, many people are you know, getting ready into travel and you know, getting cars and so forth. However, uh, the rapid growth of uh, travel also creates a lot of problems in China. And here is just one report that came out from the World Bank uh, in 2006, where they highlight some of these issues, uh, probably not specific to China, or maybe representative in other countries, but you know, in China, right, we are probably seeing some of the local issues. Whether again you are in Shanghai or Beijing or any other other tier one or tier two cities, right? We are all seeing something very very similar. You know, farmland is converting into you know uh, commercial you know uh, uh, places, uh, traffic accidents, and one of the well known issues is probably the auto pollution. If you walk you know on streets in China, right, pretty much you might you know get dirty very very easily because the dust and all the pollutants. Uh, not to mention the traffic congestions too. So there are a lot of issues in China. Uh, now the Chinese government is also looking into uh, correcting uh, in terms of green mobility. Um, uh, here, right, there are a couple of good definitions about, about green mobility. Uh, one of the ways that they explain is uh, a transport system producing zero emissions and sparing the surface landscape while people on average range hundreds of kilometers daily. So that's one way of looking into green mobility. Another way I probably is making more sense actually is from the patrolprices.com. They said that a vehicle that is considered to be environmentally friendly and have less of a damaging impact to the environment as a conventional cars. Here in the US, right, we most largely think about this as something that runs on renewable fuels. Ethanols, you know, these type of biofuels and things like that. And maybe that would be the same true for China. If China can really move into alternative fuels, green mobility, right? I think some of these issues like the global climate change, uh, dependency on fossil fuels like energy security, urban pollution, and auto industry growth probably might be reduced. These are the problems that are associated with uh, green mobility. However, do we really know what green mobility is? Right? Can we really do, uh, in China, can we really find a way to take it, that into account when you're considering different modes of transportation? That's the really uh, a driving force for this project. I mean, I ask you now, too bad, you know, I, this is the color, it's, it's not right. But, uh, you know, if it's like plain color, you will see these two vehicles in green color. Okay, this is a green truck. And this guy, this truck is carrying all the greens. Okay, so this is green mobility. Or is it something like this? There's probably a, a donkey carrying a, a car with no fuel use, zero. So is it called green mobility? Could be. But more importantly is that we've been bombarded by these terms, hybrid, ICE, you know, plug-in hybrid, or biofuels, or anything like this, right? So the problem is, what is good for China? Dictated by the Chinese government, might be. But, you know, if you want to define some sort of green mobility or alternative fuels vehicle in China, what could that be? 
you might have seen all these terms, right? P, H, E, V, E, V, and F, E, V, H, V, E, L, E, V, and all so forth. So really, there are so many different terms. So I guess, you know, it's up to us as, uh, as engineers and, you know, as uh, academia, right, to really have the gap and understand what works best for China in terms of alternative fuels and green mobility. And yet, how can we use that approach into what we call the multimodal uh, transportation system so that maybe in the future, we are more aware of doing alternative, we are aware of the environmental friendly options. Let's say if you have a cell phone, like what, uh, what uh, Shu show on the video, right, maybe in the future, right, this option, this when you plug in into your choice of uh, transportation, you can say, okay, I want to minimize the use of fossil fuel. So how do I get from point A to point B that could really achieve that goal? Something like that. So seamless multimodal transportation, as uh, what Rich and, um, and Sue pointed out, right, it really depends on your choice. How do you define your travel? Okay, what are you looking for? Connectivity? You definitely don't want to miss the connection, right? But that is a part of the, uh, the equation. How about accessibility? When you go to that place, right, is it really a way for you to go to the next one? Not to mention that there are com convenience and comfort that are huge factors that we need to look into that. Is it affordable, right? If the only choice you have is to take another taxi cab to another place, that might not be affordable. Is it efficient enough? Right? You know, it could be, you know, maybe that route is keep going around in a way so that it's not very efficient in terms of time. Last but not least is safety. Uh, is it safe to ride from that mode to that, one mode to another mode? Okay. Generally in China, right, you know, it's, it's even severe because, you know, if any of you have been to China before, right, you know, different regionals have different needs. So whether you're in the urban area or suburban or even regional, all these have different, you know, criteria of infrastructure to you. Now, if you want to factor in, you know, I'm an environmentally friendly person, I want to make sure that what I'm doing is environmentally friendly. So you might consider low, low carbon options, taking a hybrid vehicle rather than a gasoline fuel vehicles, taking an electric vehicle versus other, other form of transportation. Is it energy efficient enough, or is it really you know, helping the use of alternative fuel and renewable energy policy too? So uh, Richard actually showed this one, and this is really our concept. Starting from the top, right, we have multimodal system provider, uh, transportation or mobility in terms of market uh, place. The policy makers may be driving our choice of um, uh, transportation by imposing some of the renewable energy policy. Use of less fossil fuels, for example. Maybe, you know, use of electric vehicles, use of hybrid vehicles in that sense. So all this would actually help behavior science, like what Rich mentioned, to drive the decision. Now, when the decision comes down in terms of many different forms, could be in terms of behavior decisions, also could be in terms of policy decisions. And they have to integrate, you know, and then make sure that we come up with the utility functions. Then, as an engineer, right, our job is really to find a better way, optimize it, so that, you know, we can use the information from the behavior science, implement that into engineering solutions. Then what next? Our goal is actually being able to use the information directly for the consumers. So through some sort of devices, maybe on a cell phone, maybe building applications, that any real-time information based on you know, the survey data and based on your choice of uh, transportation can be shown to you right away. So we are thinking about a process like this, so it's like a dynamic, it's a really a, a mobility dynamic because you're getting real-time information from one end based on all this survey and based on you know, regional interests and regional settings so that you can have really the latest. Maybe your transportation mode in Shanghai would be different than if you're in Beijing. Right? You can see that because of different, different uh, you know, scenario and situation like that. So our approach is very easy, uh, very, very logical in a way that we want to really do a good job of understanding what the Chinese you know, uh, market is. What we have, the data we've got here in the US and maybe on the world might not be that applicable in China, to China. It's because you know, different costumes and different traditions and also different interests or, or, or criteria in terms of, of uh, transportation. So we are thinking about doing a, a very detailed literature survey and identify data and pick the targets that this type of approach can be applied. We will develop, like what Rich said, a behavior models in terms of quantitative models uh, from consumer uptake and behavior and maybe even on government policy and then transform those models into mathematical models and optimize using engineering approaches. Any type of you know, generic algorithms or any type of, you know, um, of um, behavior couldn't be looked into in that situation. And last but not least is to really implement and design a pilot scale real-time traffic data to look into 
how can we do it in a seamlessly way so that consumer can go from door to door you know, with, with the type of objective they have in mind, whether it's the, you know, the minimum use of fossil fuel or the least cost or you know, the least amount of time, for example. So these are the ideas that we are thinking along this idea. And then I'll let uh, uh, Ben to look into uh, other parts of the uh, uh, mobility. <laughs> 